So on this week's episode of Be More Super, the podcast, we've got another great guest from Wales. He has not only been a werewolf, a mean guard, and even Darth Vader. Yes, we've got Spencer Wildin. Spencer, hey, well, 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 welcome to the show, my man. Yeah, thanks for bringing us on, man. Yeah, so um, am I allowed to call you Big Spence? Well, that's my nickname. So yes. you can call it. I've had a lot of things thrown at me over the years, so uh, yeah, big spend's good. Yeah, big spend's it's, good. It's like me, I've been told, I've been called so many names in the past, so I just answer to all of them. Um, yeah. So we just had a, a quick chat before recording. Um, before we get into your amazing journey, that's all I can describe it. It's a bit like a, a Rocky story. It's so inspirational, you know, it's, mm. it's, it's like, it's not how, how hard you can hit, it's how hard you can get hit and keep moving forwards. And you've, you know, if you don't mind me saying, you've struggled quite a bit in your early life. And to see you in a position now where you've starred in so many blockbuster movies, and it's just fantastic. Um, so let's, let's start at the beginning, the, the beginning of Spencer, born in Rill, um, am I right in saying that? Well, I was born in St. Tassus. It was the smallest city in the world at one stage. I think it's been taken over now. But uh, yes, it's a very small city, but it's got a very, very big cathedral. Yeah. Um, and then that's like five miles away from uh, Sunny Rill. Yeah. So I moved to Rill when I was like two months old. And then we moved from there to Prestatin, then to Brett Melodon, then back to Rill. Uh, so... I'm yeah. back in Sunny Real, so I've been in Sunny Real for a long time now. Uh, mm. We've got lots of beautiful families here, beautiful kids. You know, yeah. we've got the seaside, we've got the mountains. It's a, it, it's, it is a seasonal town as well, so we get a lot of families coming in for, for the campsites and stuff like that. But yeah, it's beautiful people around here. And Real is a fantastic place. I exper- uh, experienced my very first swimming pool with a wave machine in Real. Well, so I, don't, yeah. I don't know if they've still got it. Yeah, it's a sun sensor. My stepdad, right? Yeah. At the time, he used to be uh, the boss of the of the sun sensor. So you know how popular I was going to be. You know. Wow. So when the, when the pool closed at eleven o'clock at night, <laughs> I was there with my Parties. mates. So when the yellow the yellow bumpy slide, we got the waves on. We had it all yeah. to ourselves. You know what I mean? So that was yeah, that was that was great. It, yeah. it, it, and it's still there. Well, it, well, the original sun sensor has been knocked down now. Right. So we, it, it's there's a, an S S two. Uh, Sun Center Two, very small, you know, very small, but it's a, uh, it's a very miniature of the original Sun Center. It would have been awesome to build the yeah. real, bring the real Sun Center back properly, how it was, and bring <laughs> the old fair back. That would be great. But that's history. You know, that would I mean? be awesome. So, and just you know. down the road, you've got lovely Colwyn Bay, um, yeah. which um, I remember my dad forcing me to climb this massive hill to the zoo. Uh, yeah, when I was yeah. young, but but Welsh Mountains Zoo. But going from Wales to Hollywood to Tinseltown, as they call it. So, how did your journey start in your career? <coughs> well, I was one of them kids that didn't go and watch football. I was the kid that, that climbed the trees and and pulled it, pulled the the animals out of the trees <laughs> and made friends <laughs> friends friends with all the animals and stuff. I was one of them kids. Um, so. I was always in and out of mischief, you know, I was always knocking on the next door neighbours for jam butties. I was just one of them kids growing up, coming through uh, Uskell Myers. At, um, uh, it was um, a Catholic school. Then I went to Pestatin High School and then I went to a farming college uh, and stuff like that. But it wasn't my path. I always had this, this pull, this isn't for you, this isn't for you. But, you know, when I was a kid, I always wanted to be a movie star. You know, people yeah. used to say... You know, oh, you got you got a name like a movie star, Spencer Wilding. I'm like, uh, but I'm sure they planted it in me back in the day, you know. Uh, but I used to think, well, how do I get to be a movie star? Because we only see movie stars when we stick the television on. You know, I'm living in yeah. North Wales. You know, it's one of them. And I had nobody at the time. I had nobody in the family that was in the films. So this voice comes to my head. I've said this many times on Q and A's and stuff. My thoughts, my conscious, whatever you want to call it. I said, so how am I going to get into the films? And this voice came back to me and said, you're going to be a professional kickboxer, boxer. You're going to be a champion. There's going to be a guy in the audience with a big fat cigar going, I oh, want to be in a movie. <laughs> you know? yeah. He wasn't there. He wasn't there. But when I, uh, when I took, I didn't start very late into the, into the kickboxing world. I was 24 years old. Yeah. You know? But the sports world was like the trainer as well. 
you know. It, it, well, it was my trainer, but it's like the father. It kept me on the good path because I live a, a little tricky time. We're always out with my mates. We were fighting. We were up to no good, and you know. We, so I come off them paths and and stuck with a with a with a good path with the training, and I went for my dreams, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so that's. That's how I started the kickboxing. It was 24. I had my first fight. It was 25. I took the Welsh title on the sixth fight, the British title on the seventh fight. And my mum said to me, Spen, can you go to Tony Scott Lee's place in town and can you take your belt with you uh, so my mum can have a picture on the mantelpiece? Yeah. Proud mum. Yeah. Son's Welsh and British champion. You know, I beat everybody else, the Commonwealth, the you know, world. I've done them all in. And then I went pro boxing undefeated there. Um, so I did that, and Tony Scott Lee, her daughter's very famous, who's um, Lisa Scott Lee out of Steps. Do you know what? I, you know I, I, uh, I used to be a red coat at Butlins. So, they are then. So, you know. uh, we used to work with H um, right, from, okay. from Steps. So, uh, yeah, Steps songs uh, through and through. I know every dan dance move. Uh, so my <laughs> kids, kids are sorted at the, uh, the discos. Yeah. But yeah, go on. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so Tony rang me back. Three days later, said, spend your pictures already. I said, great. Because I went into, I sort of went into the fighting, because I listened to my thoughts, right? Went into the fighting to get myself into the films. But I've been to the fighting now for five or six years, and I was very deep in, you know? Yeah. So I thought that was the entertainment thing. This is the dream, right? So I completely forgot about the films. So when, when, they, uh, when my pictures were ready, he rang me up and said, spend your pictures are ready, and... And he said, Spen, have you ever thought about being in the films? And then all of a sudden, this light bulb went boom <laughs> off the top of my head. I went, carry on, Tony. He goes, well, I've got some friends down in London that own a, a sports agency down in Crystal Palace at the time called Sports Workshop. And um, they said that they have many athletes top of the game and they put them into adverts, films, TV. So could, could I send your pictures off? Because you've got a good look, Spen. I said, all right, and great, no problem. Three days later, the owner of the agency come down and verbally signed me up. Uh, but at the time, like you know for these Q&As, I was very dyslexic. I couldn't read yeah. or write at 32 years old, you know, because I, I was all sports, you know. And I, in school, back in the day, they didn't understand about dyslexia. They thought I was just a class clown, so I just messed about and got my attention that way, you know. I wound yeah. the teachers up to death, but it's the only way I could get my attention, right? Because I couldn't read all right, right? and it's not in the, you're not in a good place. So, so I did that, and but the first thing they sent me for was Snatch, right? Yes. To play Tommy. Yeah. Yeah, to play Tommy in Snatch. So I'd just been signed up this agency. I've got no knowledge of acting, nothing at all, <laughs> right? I couldn't read or write, right? So it's a big no-no for an actor who can't read or write when you go down to an audition. They pass you a script. You know, so the, the, so you put yourself in where my head and my, my body was all fully grown. But I had like a mind of a 10 year old because I had no knowledge of the paperwork in theory. I, you know, I've, I've lived many lives, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm, I've got plenty of wisdom. But um, so they, I, I, I thought I was going to get off this train to red carpet and trumpets, literally, you know, you're in the movies. You know, so I got to Three Mill Studios where they're casting the film in there. And uh I got to the security gate and they, they, they took my name. Uh, they give me a badge and they said, go right, go down here, go down there, wait at the canteen uh, and there'll be somebody there to meet you. So I got there and this one of the producers, very, very excited, got hold of me and he was, he was just looking at me and goes, you, you've got a great face, we, we want you for this part. All you need to do, just just get, get the audition out of the way and um, you've you basically got the job. All right, okay, and he passed me this dialogue. You know, like, uh, you know, it was like, I, I was so, sometimes I get, at, the, at the time, I'm a million times better now, but at the time, I used to walk into a bank and I sometimes couldn't fill my own name in. You yeah. know, I'd have good days, bad days with this dyslexia brain I have. Yeah. So I went up to the room and there was 10 people over that table, Guy Ritchie. I, there were some big people around that table, you know. So I started reading this, the, the dialogue, the, the, the audition uh, script. Um, like a five-year-old would bring Thomas the Tank Engine badly, mm. you know? At first, they laughed and giggled, and then they really, then the penny dropped, and they realised, uh, oh, this guy can't read. You know, what the hell's, you know, what's going on? And now they said, they said right, okay, put the, put the, put the script down, Spender, because it's a gear, I'm getting stressed out. Put the script down and self-prov. 
I didn't know what these words meant they were saying to me. So I just over exaggerated everything, and then they just and that I just crashed and flopped that one. I'd love to see that tape now to where yeah. I'm at now, you know. But anyway, that would be gone. <laughs> so I come out the room, the audition room. One of the producers come out behind me because I was, man, I was, I was scared. I was, I was upset. <laughs> All these dreams have just crashed, you know. Yeah. All these thoughts that tell me what I'm going to be doing. So I'm sort of connected to my path. How the hell could I be an actor if, if I can't read or write? You know what I mean? So he come out and he said, listen, do yourself a favour. Get yourself some sight reading lessons because you've got a face for what we want. Yeah? So I took it on board and started having some sight reading lessons. It was very, very difficult for me. Uh, but we just chipped away, chipped away, chipped away, chipped away. I'd never give up, never give up. But I was still active with the fighting as well. I my, I've been filming now for 17 years. But... I, Eight years ago, I had a fight. You know, that was my last fight. So I was, I was halfway through my career, I was still active fighting. So yeah. I come away from that, come away from that, and it sent me for some more auditions. And then the phone went quiet for 12 months, right? And then I give up that dream. I thought, right, this is the fight, and I can't read, right? You know, I can't read it, right? So that's it. But I was the town, I was the town kid that did good. So they were always asking me the papers and stuff. How are you getting on with the films? And I just like swerve away from, from the question, you know. Oh, I'm busy with the fighting, blah, blah, blah. So um, they, they, a certain person rang me up 12 months later and said, hey, Spen, are you still uh, going for the films? I said, you know what? I, I have problems reading and stuff like that. So uh, I'm just staying with the fights. And said, no, on Radio 1, Warner Brothers are looking for a really, really tall actor to play the wealth werewolf in prison of azkaban and then this bulb went off in my head again I went, hey, okay right okay so i rang my agency at the time because i have another another agency now called uh, morello cherry i've had him for 15 years more of an acting agent and um well they are an acting agent but it, they don't really deal with sports people as such mm. uh more more actors um but there's a lot of sports people that do acting as well I don't want to dig the old hole for yourself there. So, uh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, 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 we got the phone call. I ran my agency up and, said, and I said, am I still signing with you guys? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've been very busy, all that palaver. And, um, I said, right, okay, Warner Brothers are looking for a very, very tall actor to play the well from the Brothers of Azkaban. Can you get me the old edition? You know? I look, all right, yeah, we're okay, we'll get back to you. It ran me back two seconds. It was like they were waiting for me, man. You know what I mean? And said, yeah, we got the audition. We've got the audition in London tomorrow. Uh, 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 leaves the studios. You've got to go to Watford, blah, blah, blah. There'll be a driver there for you to take to the audition. I said, okay, cool, cool, cool. Right, okay, great. So I got there. There must have been 30 people in the room. It was a closed audition, right? Yeah. It was a closed audition. So the, it, nobody, no job blogs to just come off the street to go for it. It was a closed audition. So, um... I got there, and yeah. there was rigorous different tests uh, with the physical side, the theory side, and, and you know, all this acting, and how, how we were on stilts. And then the, I had a callback, and I'm thinking, what's a callback? <laughs> and I was like, call back. Okay, call back, all right? So they called me back the following week. And then there was like half the people had gone, like, what's going on here? You know? So, yeah. and it was breaking down, you know, because I was learning, always learning, because I knew, I didn't know about all these, these auditions and things like that, because I'd only been to a few and crashed. So, uh, so I was learning all every day. I was learning. So on the last audition, on the third callback, there was like me and another six guys, right? So, and they cut the, the three of them went, and the, myself, Marnix, Van der Brook, and another guy. I don't think the other guy was getting the part. I think he was with the production, and just to see what those me and him were saying. You know what I mean? If we were going to ring the papers straight away and say, "Hey, <laughs> I'm on the part," you know, you're always going to have them guys there. Yeah. It's good. It's protection. You know, they don't know who they're employing. You know, it's, it, so me and Marnix, Van der Brook landed that part. And then all of a sudden, I got Batman, I got Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, yeah. and blah, blah, blah. And it just flowed. And, you know, what a, and, what a, and what a way to start your career with Harry Potter, which is amazing. Yeah. You know, this it's is a amazing. franchise that has made billions world worldwide. I mean, going back to, you know, <coughs> your early career um, and your kickboxing, what, what was your biggest driving force? Because, you know, obviously you had so many challenges not being able to read and write. And my, myself, I had speech therapy for about nine years because... I had a really bad stutter and I couldn't speak. So right. I got bullied a lot. And um, yeah. I've heard that you said that you got 
a bit bullied mm. as well when you was younger. But what was your driving for, uh, you know, force to get to, you know, to that point of it going was, it, You know what? It was me path. And I, mm. it, I was, it was like, right, okay, strap yourself in. It's going to be a fast ride, slow ride, up and down ride, round and round in circles. Just strap yourself in. And, yeah. and, and, I, and, you, and I was going, I was going up to London. I was using all my money from my wages a week to go to that audition. It cost me £100 to go to London and back. And then I'd be skinned. And then I'd get another one the following week and I'd be skinned. But I was just doing it and doing it and doing it and doing my training. And I just knew it was my path. Yeah. And I just knew it. I just, I get, there's no way, there's no way it was going to let me go. And it was always pulling me and pushing me and pushing me and pulling me. It was like I've lived that world in a past life and they wanted me back or something. Very yeah. spiritual. Really. And um, and I just I, I'm loving it every moment. If, it, if the ride stops tomorrow, it's thank you very much. Yeah. I've, thank you for letting me live these dreams and <laughs> and meeting all these great people and <clears throat> living living all these characters. It's just amazing, yeah. you know. I'm, yeah, amazing. I mean, what uh, was the first day uh, like filming on Harry Potter? Because <laughs> first job, it's amazing. What was it surreal? Was it just amazing to be on set? Or or what was the <laughs> what was the most unusual thing that you had to encounter on set well meeting famous actors you know it's like <laughs> oh my god Tony Radcliffe, Amani, Rupert you know and I was meeting all these people Alan Rickman and everybody I was meeting them all you know I was got to meet them I, you know I I, I, I wasn't a drama school talk you know I, I, I got my confidence through, through life and the, comf- and the, the boxing ring and yeah. the kickboxing ring so they knew I was not I you know, the my, my big man upstairs brought me in, you know what I mean? And I, I just, um, it was just at the first, because it wasn't walking on the set, it was three months training first with Ailsa Burke, right? Who's one of the best uh, movement coordinators out there and brilliant performer, self and actor. Uh, and and she was training me in Marnix. And Marnix was a six foot seven ballet dancer from, from uh, Holland, you know, right. using cats. These, uh, he, he, he knew the world, man. Do you know what I mean? And I was so, so Marnix should bring, uh, and we were at Nick Dudman's, uh, Nick Dudman did all the Harry Potter films. Uh, and so I was writing at the deep end in the beginning. So Marnix should bring like some uh, flowers in and some chocolates and some sweets and some, and some fruit for the guys in the, in the creature department. So I thought, oh, this is what we do. So I went out and got it as well. So I was just copying, <laughs> I was copying everything Marnix was doing, you know, because I didn't know. Yeah. I wasn't trying to go, well, mine are better. I just thought, well, this is the way, you know? So I was learning that. And and we just, and it was just an amazing experience. And I still have the same buzz every time I walk on a set now. And I've done over 50 films, yeah. you know? It's just, I, I'm not still a big kid when it comes to things like that. And what was know? the makeup like? Because um, the makeup from the pi- the pictures and the film is just astonishing. And for your yeah, first, well, was... first experience to be you know, mm. made up by these professionals from, you know, the biggest, you know, production companies out there. What what was it like? Well, walking into the creature department in the beginning, you know, obviously they, we had to have a thing called live cast, right? So I'm sure you know what a live cast yeah. is when, when they basically mummify you. And I was growing friends all the time as well. There's a really, really close <laughs> friend of mine at the time called Mar- uh, Martin Fowler. My dad was, his dad was Barry Fowler, and we've become best friends. He's passed away now, you know what I mean? But he, he went too early, but he was, he was a very, very good friend of mine. So every time I was going in, it was, I was going into my mate's house in a way, you know what I mean? It's one of them. <laughs> you know? and every, every time he'd gone in there with Chinese stilts on and doing different live casts, uh, and I was just every day learning. So, and I'd learned how to use these stilts in the beginning because they'd never used these stilts before. For, for, they weren't like stilts to just make taller. They were like hind legs shaped, like like such, like yeah. get out and out on an arm belt as a, a dog leg, you know. So we had to learn how to use these, but it, they were all tests. So in the beginning, they was putting, giving us boots with heels on it, and me and Marnix were just ripping our heels to death with uh, with blisters, and we were just doing it and doing it and doing it. And I was just taking it. I was like, yeah, yeah, great, God, give me some more blisters. I'm loving it, you know. <laughs> and then when we got to the stilts, we were walking on these stilts, and then we were inside the suit because when you see the werewolf, it's 99 point CGI, you know. Mm. There's like I think there's like one point, a really wide shot when we're, when when he's just transformed, yeah. Um, when Daniel's uncle has just transformed into a werewolf. 
or no, that was uh, no, the Wales was Professor Lupin, wasn't it? Uh, and then uh, Series Black or whatever, it's gone out my head. So that was many years ago. So w- when he changed at the tree, but at the, but at the set, uh, I think it was at Shepperton Studios, the these stilts didn't have like ankles on them; they were flat and they were shaped like a hind leg. At the time, if it was now, they'd have little, they'd have all the little gizmos on, so you could work yeah. the actor could work better in them. And um, so we were all over the place. We're putting a wire on our back, and you know, there's only so much a human being could do. And me and Marley were we're doing more than a human being. You know, but there's only so much you could do. That's why they CGI'd the character, you know, because it, it would have looked like a guy in a suit wobbling all over the place with certain scenes. Um, but if you watch, if you, if you, I think, I don't know if you've ever been to the museum. Um, at, at, you know what? At, you know what? I haven't. Museum. Yeah, I haven't. Yeah. I really want to as well. Well, the, the, the suit will be there. And oh, you'll right. see you'll see pictures of me and Marnix there. And it'll show the human inside the, the, the suit. On our head is in, in the neck. It looks like the the um, the Wells has an Adam's apple, right? But that's our nose pushing yeah. on it, right? And then you'll have puppeteers behind the camera working the animatronic head, you know? To look at it, you think it's very real, you know? And we, we did put the performance in as best we could, you know, yeah. before then it went to a guy in a suit. Um, but yeah, that's the first time when we put the suit on it was just wow, you know. And I was looking as that people are looking from the outside. Lots of visitors going, "Wow, I'm going inside the suit." Wow, I'm just going up it. You know, it's just on these suits. And I've I, obviously I've had a lot of full makeups over the time as well. These suits, they are wizards who make yeah. these suits, and these they're so talented. You know what I mean? They're yeah. really talented, yeah. and it's just awesome to be around all these so brilliant human beings you know and then and then your journey continues and you're in hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy and then batman begins i mean yeah. it must have been oh, just amazing to be in all all these amazing movies and obviously you were league of the uh, shadow warriors um yeah how was that to film on bat, bat batman begins how was that for you well to be on any batman it's just like Oh, I'm a Batman, you know. What I mean? <laughs> yeah. And I, 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 I grew friends at the, at the time. It was, it was Buster Reeves, uh, who was doing Batman, um, and I come really close friends with Bobby Holt Hatton, Holly Hatton, and he was he was a, a Batman as well. So, yeah. and I was very very close to the stunt stunt world as well. I've been down as a stuntman as well. Privileged to be down as a stuntman a few times because them guys are something else. You know, they they've got to be six in professional sports, above professional, yeah, in, in six different arts. You know. Um, too old. If I was twenty years younger, I would have had a crack at that. I think. Do you know what I mean? Because they are the elite in the in the industry. Um, but yeah, it was uh, it was brilliant to be on a Batman film. It's a League of the Shadow Warrior one. And again, there was two. There's a bit of a curse for the leagues because uh, Dave Legino's past now. Dave was a very good friend of mine, and Carl Boff dropped down dead on stage uh, rehearsals. And so there's fact there's, there's myself, Rodney, and Ruben left out the League of the Shadows. You know, wow. the, other, the, other, the other two are gone. Yeah, but uh, good friends of Dave. I, mean, I really, really miss Dave. But me and Dave, Dave threw the pencil down in uh, Bruce Wayne's manner and I torched it. So it's <laughs> not, you know, you can have that, like, yeah, burn down Batman's house, tick that one off. There we go, yeah. <laughs> no, tick that one off. You know, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, again, brilliant film. I was, uh, yeah. uh, I was a uh, um, Vogon soldier number one. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm the guy that, Chucks him in the chamber and go, his uh, resistance is futile, and they're doing all the close up stuff. Um, yeah, it's just, oh, it, what, a, what a start to a career, you know? Oh, God, yeah. God, yeah. I mean, the, I mean, the thing, the, the thing is, you look at um, I, IMDb and you see everyone's career, and they start off in very small like parts on TV, like Casualty and Holby City and mm-hmm. places like that. For you, it's like, bam, straight there, plot, <laughs> plot busters, let's. <laughs> By bypass all the small shows and let's get in there. I mean, you look at Stardust, you know, Robert De Niro. I mean, how starstruck was you during the filming of that? Because I've seen a picture on your Instagram of you uh, yeah. cud- 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 cuddling up to the uh, man himself. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, I've always been, you know, he wasn't a fan of Robert De Niro. You know, yeah. I remember that we were at Shepton Studios and 
the first day they uh, brought us into the room was myself, gorgeous George out of Snatch, uh, Dexter Fletcher, uh, um, and a few others, you know. So there's about five of us pirates, we were the main pirates, and they brought us in. And then through the side door in the room, who comes in? Mr. De Niro. All out, <laughs> whoa, clapping and stuff like that. And he goes, and he gives us the bottom lip. And, I, I like, and he goes, yeah, yeah. And he goes, first of all, I don't answer to Mr. De Niro. Uh, it's Bob. I went, oh, man, Bob. That's it. Can I call him Mr. De Niro? <laughs> it's very hard calling him Bob. But it's his name, so that's it. Yeah. He wants to be called yeah. Bob. And, that, and that's, we respect that, and we call him Bob, you know. That's um, it. You're in the friend zone now. So, yeah. Yeah. But, but to, to work with Mr. De Niro, Bob, I was, I was probably one of the quietest guys on set. He's the one that got me quiet. I was quiet. Every time I walk past him, I'd be smiling. And he'd go, trying to get, a, trying to get me, get something me to open up to him. And uh, it took me weeks. And then I remember we were on a, a wet set uh, where the pirate ship was, and I sat in the barrel. And his back, his back was to mine. It, it, my back was to his. We touched his shoulders, <laughs> and there was a million things in my head. Oh, you know, we all have the moments where we, you know, put a foot in it. And um, my, my, my head was going, say hello to him, say hello to him, because I was just like a fan of him, and I just couldn't get, couldn't get out of it at the time. I don't me now, it would be a different story, we'd go for a pint. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, uh, he, and I went, uh, so there's a million things to say to him, and I turned around and go, so uh, where are you from, Bob? Oh, I don't want him to say that. You know what I mean? <laughs> Do! And he goes, New York, where are you from? I said, I'm from Wales. And he goes, oh, i got a friend in Wales called John, you know him? So he took the piss straight away. I was like, brilliant. <laughs> but yeah, it, yeah, yeah, it was funny, man. It was really, 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 really funny. But you know, take that one off. Yeah, yeah I was one definitely. Of Robert De Niro's boys, you know what I mean? So, you know, it, it was Stardust, a great film, really yeah. good, great, great film. And I was in, uh, I was in uh, Golden Compass as well, next to it. So we were sort of both filming together, quite yes. close. Yeah, other. I had a friend uh, called Nicola Curzon who mm. doubled for the little girl. Oh, right. I've said you a story up. about the little girl now. Right? Yeah, go on then. Right. Because there was a couple of scenes I was in, and uh, there's a scene on the boat. I think it's the second boat they walk onto, right? And as she's walking past me, you probably wouldn't recognise me in this, right? I'm sat on the barrel again, play, polishing my gun, and I'm looking at her, and she walks past me, and she goes, what do you think you're looking at? You know what I mean? Like a little yeah. madam towards me, and then goes, mm, and walks off. And, and I said, because I knew... I knew all the all the, the the main actors and stuff. They all had their spirit animal. Yes. And I was saying to the boys, you know, I was helping out on that film. I said, oh, any chance I can have a little animal like on my shoulders? <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and, and they went, oh, no, no, it's just for the main. Because that cost a few quid to put a, an animal on your shoulder, you know. Yes. And um, But when I went to watch the film, they put a big, massive eagle on my shoulder. And I was like, ah, yes! You know, yes. I made a, yeah, it was brilliant. And, you know, they had, they had a confidence in me there as well, the stunt, stunt team as well, because there's a scene where, you know, when everybody's fighting in the snow and the big big pole of air comes through and knocks everybody out, yes. out of the way and blah, blah, blah. Well, they had like a £30 million character, uh, camera coming straight down on the wires, coming straight down uh, above uh, Eva Green's head uh, and then going forward. But... Every time it was coming down, it was getting a bit of a wobble on it. You know what I mean? So they weren't getting mm. a shot. And they said, Spend, do you think you can catch the camera when it's coming down? And then I had a big fight scene in front of it. So I had to come down, catch the camera, run with it for a little bit, get it nice and steady, and then run in front of it and have a big fight scene with some about eight guys. <laughs> so, so again, now, so now you're a camera off, op op camera. operative, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cameraman, cameraman, yeah, pull out the CD, cameraman. <laughs> So, so yeah, so The Golden Compass, what a wonderful mo movie. But you was in uh, Wrath, Wrath of the Titans as yeah. a, a Manator, and you looked amazing in that. That was amazing, just amazing. costume. Well, well, me... I don't know what mm. you'd call it, outfit, prosthetics. I mean, uh, yeah, prosthetics. would you go down the pub in that? <laughs> Mate, I tell you what, I'd give a few people a horn if I did. <laughs> I'd seen a horn. But it, it, there was four Titans on the show, three of them were CGI, and then the performance of the actor inside and the makeup, we yeah. didn't need CGI for my character, you know? So, uh, again, working with Sam Worthington, uh, it, was, it was good fun, you know? Yeah. I did my job and everybody was happy and the makeup was just out of this world. Goran did the makeup for that and it was for Connor 
Connor or was it Connor O'Sullivan? It might have been maybe get corrected on this, or it might be Neil Gorton. Can't remember at the moment. Um, yeah, I can't remember which which maker team was, but that was a six hour makeup. Yeah, that was a six hour makeup, and I remember because when I go into character, right, you've got a real Minotaur in front of you, you got a real pirate, you got a real Darth Vader. The spirit and presence takes over me. Suspense is not there no more. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's not there. So I remember Sam coming up. I said to Sam, I said, listen, these horns are not real, Sam. Mr. Mr. Uh, Sam Worthington, right? So if you do this to my neck, to my horn, you hurt my neck. If you do this, you break my neck, you know, literally. Because these horns are like a foot and a half long. Yeah. So they've got some yeah. leverage on them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So I went running at him. Have you seen the scene in Wrath of the Titans? Yes. When we're, yeah. yeah. So he, we're running. I'm running at him. Got him. He's got my horns. And he twists me. And I'm like, ah! Oh! <laughs> I just throw myself out a bit quick. I said, Sam, Sam, please. Please, you, you, you'll break my neck. And then he, because he was, he was full on. When he gets stuck into you, he gets stuck into you. Because he's yeah. beating it. He's beating this Minotaur. Two right, probably do the same thing. It's a frightening thing, a Minotaur, when it's coming at you, you know? <laughs> but we got, we got to pull it pull it down a little bit. But, yeah, and he was putting the punches in as well. So when it was my turn to beat him up, yeah, yeah, he felt it off me. So it, <laughs> it was good. He's a fit guy. You could take it. He's a brilliant actor. Yeah. And you've worked with quite a few uh, big names. I mean... Let's let's go 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 back. You mentioned like Alan Rickman, who's a legend, but legend. you know you look at like Hugh Jackman, um, yeah. Daniel Radcliffe, <laughs> um, The Rock. Mm. Um, how was The Rock to work with? Is he as nice as everyone says, or is he a bit of a diva? You know what? He's even more beautiful than he is. Oh no, 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 he is. He's is he? a lovely love. Oh man, what a man. I'm not just kissing RC you now. He's a brilliant actor, right? But the guys in the gym so dedicated to keep that physique alone yeah. takes probably about five or six hours a day training, you know, to keep that. And the you probably you know you'll probably have to have a wake up every three hours to feed, you know, <laughs> to keep that size. But you, I, I got on that job there. It was it was sort of um, how I got on that job. I was working on Men in Black International playing Luca Brase. Right, and Hollywood gave me that Luca Brasi name. He's you know swimming the fishes. He's a uh, original Godfather, you know the Godfathers yeah. in, the, in the trilogy. Luca Brasi. So I was buzzing when I got that Luca Brasi. I was buzzing. Uh, uh, get the film out of the way, but I just want to see the credits. I thought, are they going to are they going to put Luca or are they going to put Brasi at the end of it as well? So when Luca Brasi came up, I was like, oh yes, you know <laughs> the second act to have that name. And I'm a big fan of the Godfathers. Maybe one day if you ever make him again, you never know. Who knows? And you never know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but yeah. So, so when I was on that show, um, I was in Italy and I was speaking to the production and I said, "Listen, you, you're doing you're doing Fast and Furious, aren't you?" And he said, "Yeah." And this is what I love about the industry here now. I still have to audition and stuff like that, and, and, you know. But I said, "Listen, my my son." I had my boy, Bobby Joe Wilding, one of my boys. I've got three children, Bobby Joe Wilding, George Spencer Wilding, and Tyler Turner, right? Um, Bobby was a massive, massive, massive Paul Walker fan, right? Yeah. So when he passed away and that, when that horrible day came and he had that accident and he didn't get through it, and they, he didn't come out of his room for a week, man. He was like, mm -hmm. he goes, Dad, he was only five and a half, six, and my, my boy was poorly as well. He was on chemos and steroids at the time, mm -hmm. but he's all good now. And um, he he didn't come out of his room, and he said, Dad, it felt like you died when, when, when he lost Paul. He knows everything about Paul Walker. He's seen yeah. all his films. And he said, one day, son, one day I'll get you to meet him. I'll, I'll maybe I'm working with him one day. So I was gutted when, when he passed away because I'd never able to make one of his dreams come true, you know? Yeah. But, I, I thank Paul Paul Walker for for being a brilliant actor and doing his job well, where he's touched a young boy's soul. Yeah, uh, to fall in love with him, man. That's a brilliant actor that can do that, you know. And he, obviously, he's, he's a good guy. Uh, so so that so the next minute, I I I, I tell him about the story, and then all of a sudden, I got a I got a call. Could you do a little cameo with one of the lads? One of the one of the guys on the Hobson Shore Fast and Furious, and I was like, "Oh, oh Bobby's going to love this." So we had a little, <laughs> we, we had, you know, we had a little deal going on. And me, me and the Rock had a little 
personalised picture together for Bobby. That it would awesome. never go. It will never go on the internet because that, that was for Bobby. That was the deal. It was just for Bobby. Do you yeah. know what I mean, my boy? And I will take that to my grave. Do you know what I mean? That is absolutely so, awesome. And that is another sign yeah. that The Rock is just a... Um, I don't think he's real. I think he's a robot and is all perfection. <laughs> and uh, no, but I can, I can remember when... I can remember when Hobbs and Shaw was advertised to be filming because it was filmed partly in Doncaster of all places yeah. and every, yeah. everyone was going mad and The Rock got, um, you know, spotted in a gym, a random gym in yeah. Doncaster. I thought, I thought it, 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 it was hilarious. But yeah. then we go on to, I think, I mean, I'm sure this part is going to be a part that you're going to cherish for the rest of your lives. Uh, you know, your whole family as well, especially your boys, is obviously Darth Vader. I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, growing up as a child, did you watch the Star Wars movies? Were you a fan of Star Wars? Well, I was five years old when uh, when I first went to see uh, in 1977. I was mm. five years old, born in 1972, and that's when 1977 really came out. And my dad, I said to my dad, I said... Um, Dad, can we go and watch his stars? Because everybody just going on about the spaceships and this, that, and the other. It was just so ahead of its time, wasn't it? And so <laughs> he took me to the town of Prasatin, to the Saturday matinee or whatever it was, to go watch the film. And we were like 10, 15 minutes in. And I can't wait for these spaceships. I'm only five. I was waiting for these spaceships with my ice cream and, I mean, you know, my popcorn. And I'm waiting for these spaceships. Can't see the spaceships. And my dad didn't. My dad didn't want to watch it, so he took me to go watch Pim Pamper instead. <laughs> so, so you Bless check you. out when that comes out. You, get, you know. So my mum, my mum, my mum went to take me to see it instead. Yeah. And uh, I remember it like yesterday. It was amazing. I'm a massive fan. Not not massive, massive fan because I do a comic cons and I meet the massive, massive fans yeah. of the comic of of these trilogies. But I'm, I, I but I love the shows. You know. Yeah. And so I remember meeting uh, Mr. Prowse, you know, he's number one, Mr. Prowse, uh, at Comic-Con 10 years plus ago. And I shook his hand and something, we had a little look back then, you know, I remember it. We had a little look, look at each other's eyes and something, something, something happened, you know, there's a little, a little hello, you know. <laughs> You're in the but, same yeah, club. <laughs> then, yeah, then seven years later, you know, we get the auditions and, uh, you know, it, it, again, but I believe it or not, every character I play, I treat them all equal because they're a gift. Yeah. You know, Darth Vader is an amazing gift. Uh, and he is a very powerful, powerful uh, presence, should I say. Um, you know, my name has been Big Spen all my life, but yeah. it, it's everybody calls me Darth now. You know, <laughs> I'm like, Darth, oh, that's it. You know, this, but, is, you know, this, is, this is what I was going to ask that for all these conventions, you know, um, you know, when you're signing the pictures, what picture do you sign the most? Is it Darth Vader? Well, believe it or not, it's, it's the mean god out of the Guardians of the Galaxy. He's, he's, you know I what? think he's ahead of. I mean, I, I think he's ahead of Darth. I you love know. you in that film. I think I think that is yeah. just a classic scene. And if if anyone as as the DVD or the Blu-ray or the 4K now or even YouTube, <laughs> they can see your dance, uh, which yeah. which which was an added scene. And it's just great. I mean, the character and just your facial expressions are just amazing. Really made yeah. me chuckle. It really did. Yeah, um, funny. So, yeah, so Darth Vader, uh, 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 you know, you're in that club now uh, with Dave Prowse, uh, which mm. I, I can, can I just say, what an awesome star. Also trained Superman Christopher Reeve to become, you know, yeah. who he was. But you've also got three roles. I was reading uh, I Am... Um, DB, and you've got three roles in common apparently with Dave Prowse. Yeah, I know. So yeah, you, you played um, Frankenstein. You was in Victor yeah. Frankenstein, another awesome yeah. film with James McAvoy and and Daniel yeah. Radcliffe again. That's it. Um, and also it says here a Manator. Um, yeah. And um, obviously Darth Vader. So yeah. you've got a lot of you know in common. Um, so moving on to, I'm, I'm looking at the time now, we're getting carried away, we're having a wonderful chat. I want to chat conventions because you have traveled the world for your convention. Mm. Guatemala. Yeah. I've seen a video on Guatemala. Yeah, you know, yeah. What did you think when you got invited to go to Guatemala for a convention? Because it's he not he your average place. 
you know, they told us they don't go certain places, or so <laughs> you won't come back out. So you've got like zone one to 20, so the zones there. But what I love about going all to these different countries, right, I, I get more of a buzz to go to the schools and talk to the kids, you know, yeah. and, and talk about anti-bullying and, and, and looking for the dyslexic kid in the room as well who hasn't got the confidence to come round, you know what I mean, yeah. and say, listen, I talk about my disability. I'm proud to be dyslexic, you yeah. know what I mean? And there's a lot of us like dyslexic out there as well. So it's, it's, so it's one of them. It, it, yeah, it's literally one of them. Um, Guatemala is a beautiful place, you know. Yeah. I did get the trots there. <laughs> did you? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, I've never had the trots before. I wonder why they call the trots, because you're trotting to that toilet. <laughs> and you might hit a full gallop. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I, I did so well. I was, I was over there for like a week. Um, we had a big security detail. Guys, shotguns, man. It just said yeah. something there, you know. Guys got shotguns. Uh, so we went to the um, the big volcano. Uh there was like three big volcanoes and I've been three days, four days and got no, no water, buying bottles of water, doing really, really good, blah, 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 blah. And this, we relaxed over this specific day and I was there with, with, with my agency, uh, uh, the Beast Within Productions USA, <coughs> and they're based in Kansas City, <coughs> the, convention, uh, the convention agency. And uh, I was there with Stacy and I was there with my mate Gavin and, and Lance uh, and we were there and we were having a few drinks and I was like, yeah, I'm doing all right. It's everything getting, uh, you know, a, a dicky tummy. I'm doing all right. And I'm drinking this like Bacardi and Coke. And then I go, I see the floating ice cubes and I go in <gasps> and I'm up to it. And I'm like, floating ice cubes. Are these uh, fresh? Oh no, you'll be all right. Oh my God. The next day. <laughs> oh my God. Oh. Honestly. <clears throat> you know, so a week later, I got blown away in the wind. I was lost that much weight. So but, lesson um, learn and, is check your yeah. ice ice cubes and make sure they're yeah, filtered. Yeah, make make your own. <laughs> yeah, make your own. Yeah, we just you know we're just not used to their water. And then when I got off that job, I was I was on Men in Black, and I was over in um, in Iesca in in Italy, one of the islands over there with Chris and with Bobby Holland Hatton and and a few of the other crew. Um, and noon of the whole of the production went down when they went uh, to Morocco because we went from there to Morocco. And I was all good. I was immune. You know what I mean? So I was, I'd already had it. I was like, oh, no, I'm okay. Bring yeah. on the ice cubes. <laughs> yeah. I didn't tell them what I was like, like four, four weeks late before. Yeah. But you know what? It's an amazing journey I'm having. You know what I mean? So, yeah. I'm, what's I'm your, what's your favourite thing about conventions? Meeting the, meeting the fans. Yeah. Literally. I'm a fan of the fans. I'm not just saying that to get more of them to come over to the table. I'm saying that because I, I love... They haven't got the budget the films have got, and they'll spend the whole year making the costume, mate. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that one specific day there, Iron Man or somebody else or somebody else, are very passionate. And uh, I just sit back and watch their magic, and then I love doing the Q&As, and I get all the kids up on the stage. And we, and I think when I was there, I was doing the, the 22 press-up challenge for PTSD for the Army soldiers, you know? Yeah. So I, I was on, I, I don't know, 16 or something. So we, we, got, we got all the kids up there to do it. And Guatemala, nice man, you know, they, they come over to the table. I've been to Mexico City and stuff. They come over to the table, about 20 in the family, yeah. you know, and they've been saving up all year to have that, that little bit of money to buy that picture off you, you know. Sure. So it's a special time, and it, I just love all that. Yeah. I mean, with everything going on in the world right now, have you got any plans on doing any virtual Comic Cons? Well, I've been invited into a couple, but I've been doing a lot of these podcasts at the moment. So yeah. I've, got, I've got another podcast tomorrow with, uh, with, with Fatboy Slim over in New York. So that'd be interesting. Uh, yeah. uh, and then I did one uh, in America uh, the other day as well. So yeah. I love getting, staying in touch with the fans, you know, because yeah. a lot of them, you know, <clears throat> it's cool to be geek these days, but some of them have been, probably been geeks all their life. So some of them have been picked on. And, you know, I know what bullying's like. I've been bullied yeah. myself. So they love the comic con. So that you know, they're not getting to go out at the moment. Do you know what I mean? And dressing up and doing the things that they they love. You know. Yeah. So it's good to stay in contact with them this way a little bit. You know. Yeah. And then I hope obviously, you're doing all right or you're not, you know? yeah. I mean, fans can follow you on Instagram. Um, yeah. So uh, you've got the Spencer Wilding account, but you've also got the Spencer Wilding merchandise account. That's right. Yeah. So. Just, yeah, just open that shop up. Uh, so I, I, it's not really a business. It's for my kids. Do you know what I mean? It's a little yeah. nest egg for them. 
So uh, if anybody wants a picture, yeah, come on um, uh, Spencer Wild and Merchandise Instagram. You know, we've been on bond for a few months, but it, it, but <laughs> but it sold a couple of pictures. But it, it, I need to be working on it every day, but I'm a bit lazy that way. So I said, kids, you sort it out. I'll sign. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Giving your kids their own business uh, mm. and responsibilities. So what is next for Big Spen? What is next well, in I've the got, pipeline? Well, I've got a film coming out at the end of the year. Can't talk too much about it, but it's called Devil. Right, yes. Uh, my, my character is called HDC, Horrific Demon Creature. You know, what I'm saying is get your cushions ready because it's going to be scary, <laughs> you know. But uh, that's as far as I can tell you. That'll come out towards the end of the year or, you know, obviously things get put back with this COP19. I've yeah. started getting a couple of auditions through. Can't talk about them, but all exciting stuff. Yeah. I keep myself busy. I'm training. I'm doing a bit of training with friends. And... Um, like I was saying before, before we started hitting record, I'm doing a bit of painting at the moment as well. I don't mind doing a bit of general work because I've always done that before the films anyway. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and yeah, I'm, I don't mind a bit of labour. I love it, you know, and I love a bit of painting. Uh, whatever job I can get in to keep the wolf away from the door. Oh, Ooh. you know what I mean? <laughs> Excellent. Um, um, before we close this wonderful interview, what makes you happy, Spen? What makes me happy? Yeah. What makes me happy is getting out of bed in the morning and going, I've got another day out of it. Yeah. And yeah. what makes me happy is seeing everybody else happy. Yeah. You know, because we've all, there's a lot of things been going on over the past couple of years. There's a change going on in the world and there's a lot of negativity out there. And we, the only way you can bash the negativity is with the positivity, you know, yeah. and we're being tested many, many ways. Just, Definitely. Don't change. Yeah. Stay to yourself. Eat good, and be careful crossing the road, kids. You know what I mean? So, oh, uh, I love that. Careful crossing the road. Another Dave Prowse there you go. There uh, you go. reference yeah, there. The got, Green Cross Code Man. Green. <laughs> <laughs> Spen, yeah. thank you so much for this opportunity. Yeah, man. You look after yourself. Have thank a you. great week and weekend, and uh, <laughs> I'm sure we'll catch up again um, at a convention uh, in mm -hmm. the future. Yeah, I'm um, kids out there. Don't underestimate the power of the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> Great advice from Big Spen. Spen, there look you after go. yourself. Thank you so much.